Hi, my name is Lynn Nace. Welcome to the webinar, Early Recognition and Risk Assessment of the Septic Patient, Part 2, sponsored by BioMiriu. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Stephen Hare is Chair, Department of Emergency Medicine and Medical Director, Morton Plant Emergency Department, and Chair, Pinellas County Medical Control Board. Dr. Devandra Amin is Director of Critical Care Services, Morton Plant Hospital. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. At this point, I'll turn the presentation over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you for introducing us. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Amin. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, our sepsis program. We would like to talk about sepsis and the importance of early goal-directed therapy uh, and how we manage sepsis here. So this is Morton Plant Hospital. Uh, we've been using procalcitonin in the intensive care in emergency room since 2008. Would like to review the early diagnosis and management of sepsis, review new changes in the surveilling sepsis guidelines, review the place of the biomarker procalcitonin, and then go over some case reviews. Dr. Hay will talk about some of our demographics. Just so uh, you understand who we are, we're located in Clearwater, Florida, which is on the Gulf Coast of Florida. It's a relatively large size hospital with 687 beds. We have 76,000 emergency department visits, one main emergency department, and we have a freestanding emergency department. We have hospital discharges of over 25,000 per year, and we have th over 3,000 births at our hospital. Sepsis, otherwise known as the Grim Reaper, is a major problem. Uh, it's the systemic inflammatory response to infection, its incidence is increasing. It's about the tenth leading cause of death in the United States. It's a common cause of organ dysfunction. It increases the cost of care and length of stay in many patients. This is a graphic looking epidemiology from Derek Angus's uh, data from 2002 in critical care medicine. But what we see here is the uh, mortality rates increasing over time, as well as the incidence as we get into the later decades of life. That data came from looking at uh, insurance submissions, looking at single organ dysfunctions associated with infection. Since about 2010, however, we've had, um, sorry, since about 2002, we've had a new ICD-9 code for sepsis, and data produced by Dombrowski and Martin would suggest that the numbers are slightly lower when you look at a more specific cohort of patients with the diagnosis of sepsis. The Number of cases is increasing per year, and probably the real number is between the two sets of data. One is very broad, catch-all type of uh, data. The other one is very specific to sepsis. However, despite the increasing number of cases annually, the case fatality rate seems to be coming down, looking at both sets of data as projected. This is because of the, probably because of the implementation of increased awareness, surviving sepsis campaign, uh, and more aggressive therapies suggesting that we're making an indent into the uh, mortality rate even though the total numbers are going up. So the good news is that despite the total numbers going up, we are overall doing a better job of recognizing and treating this patient. The cost is very high in terms of days, in terms of 21 to 23 million days per annum in 2005 numbers, and the cost varies from $2,600 to almost $3,500 a day in the intensive care unit. The annual cost for the sepsis in the United States in $2,000 is about $16 billion, probably much more today. And length of stay can vary from a low of seven days to almost 27 days, depending on the situation. And the average cost also can vary from $17,000 to almost $103,000, depending on your location, other complications that occur with a prolonged length of stay from this disease process. The original consensus conference on sepsis in 1992 looked at the SIRS criteria and really felt that this was an appropriate way to determine whether somebody had the potential of being infected and potentials for sepsis. This hasn't changed over time. Uh, however, we know this is not terribly specific. Um, there's an overlap between systemic inflammatory response syndrome and the findings in infection and it is not truly specific. We look at temperature, elevation or low temperature, increased heart rate, leukopenia, um, leukocytosis or leukopenia with greater than 10 percent immature band forms to suggest there's a diagnosis of infection. The sepsis is defined as SIRS with infection, which can be localized. 
As it becomes more systemic, you get severe sepsis, where you see the development of organ dysfunction. And then you get into septic shock, which is severe sepsis with persistent hypotension, despite adequate initial fluid resuscitation, adequate aggressive initial fluid resuscitation. As you can see from this slide, the severity of disease increases, uh, and mortality rate increases as you go from SIRS to sepsis, severe sep septic shock, going from a mortality rate of 7% up to almost 46%, 50%. The number of organ failures as well. As you go up in the number of organ failures involved, your mortality rate goes up. When you get to three or more organs involved that you're failing in this uh, syndrome, you'll get a greater than 70% mortality rate. Another very important fact is the, is the recognition of early sepsis in the emergency room is the key to survival. If you recognize the patient early, they go to the intensive care unit, rather than to the floor, and then to the intensive care unit, the mortality rate is significantly improved, 37% versus 47% in this particular study. I think a very key study looking at sepsis and the determinants of outcome uh, was the Kumar study from 2006 in critical care medicine. This looked at the duration of hypotension before the initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy on survival. And this was uh, a, a retrospective review of sepsis patients with hypotension from 1989 to 2004 through 14 intensive care units in Canada and the United States, involving some 2,700 patients. No intervention. What this showed was that there was a significant decrease in survival as the time went on or as effective antibiotics came on board. There was a cumulative effective antimicrobial initiation following the diagnosis of hypotension. Your survival rate decreased for every hour's delay. So imagine a situation, somebody gets diagnosed with hypotension associated with sepsis. Well, in that setting, for every hour's delay of getting effective antibiotics into the patient, it can take a 7.6% reduction in survival for every hour's delay, increase in mortality. So if you imagine writing, recognizing the patient as being hypotensive from sepsis, writing a prescription, sending it to the pharmacy, getting the medication delivered back to the in, emergency room or the intensive care unit, and then delivering the medicine, that can take sometimes 90, 120 minutes. Um, and this data suggests quite strongly that there's a strong relationship between survival and speed of getting the antibiotics. From this study, the survival rate for antibiotics uh, in the first hour was 79.9%, at about five to six hours was 42%. If you received effective antibiotics at nine to 12 hours, it was only 25%. So there's a 7.6% reduction in survival for every hour's delay. That's very important. Through the 1990s and the early part of the century, we were really looking to find a magic bullet to cure sepsis, but that never really panned out. There was no specific antibody we could use. Drogecogen alpha went by the wayside. And Roger Bone summed it up aptly earlier than that by saying that rather than trying to find a magic bullet to cure sepsis, maybe the focus should be on early recognition, which is imperative, I think, in this setting. Dr. Hale will discuss some of the early findings that we have that might help us in this diagnosis. Sure, and we, we do have at our disposal some early uh, identifiers of patients that are at risk through global indicators being your serum bicarb, uh, your serum lactate as well with or without evidence of acidosis, uh, the base deficit, measuring the saturation of hemoglobin after the capillary perfusion, venous mixing, which is your SCVO2, and also the mixed venous oxygen saturation. Lactate measurements uh, are important as well. Serial measurements of the blood lactate level may guide your therapy. A serial lactate level is a predictor of mortality. It is currently what is considered the gold standard. Normal less uh, than 2.5, mild acidosis being 2.5 to 4.9. And as you can see, that it increases your mortality to 25 to 35% moderate acidosis between 5 and 9.9. .9. That brings your mortality up to 60 to 75%. And severe acidosis greater than 10, now bringing the mortality up to nearly 95%. Now remember, serum lactate can increase for other reasons besides infection, and that would be dehydration, seizure, ischemic bowel, 
exercise, and liver dysfunction. So the sensitivity and specificity are much lower than you would have with PCT. One of the earlier studies looking at lactate clearance um, was kind of indicative of response to therapy. We see here uh, on the right-hand side, if you reduce your lactic acid, if the patient's lactic acid came down by more than 10% in the first six hours of aggressive therapy, the mortality rates were significantly improved compared to patients who did not reduce their lactate through, despite the aggressive therapy. These responders versus no res non-responders uh, was, was important to differentiate as the survival was significantly reduced if the patients did not respond to appropriate therapy. We'll move on to the Surviving Sepsis Campaign guideline changes, which came through 2012 and 2013 and were published in Critical Care Medicine earlier this year. The data is based now on a 28,000 patient database, which showed a 25% relative risk reduction and 30% improvement in compliance in the bundles over the last four years. All elements of the resuscitation bundles were independent predictors of survival or mortality when omitted. The data also supported an extended Kumar's data demonstrating delays in antibiotic administration impacted survival at the rate of 5% per hour as opposed to 7.6, another powerful indicator of early recognition and speed to uh, delivery of appropriate therapy. What's required with the new three-hour bundle is to measure serum lactate initially, obtain blood cultures prior to antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics within three hours of emergency department admission, or one hour of in-house recognition of sepsis, treatment of hypotension in the presence of, as well as in the presence of elevated lactic acid when it's greater than four, with at least uh, a 30 cc's or 30 mils per kilogram initial bolus of crystalloid over the first hour or so. The resuscitation bundle, which is to, be, is to be completed within the first six hours from recognition, the timing actually starts from when you hit the door, and which isn't always the same as when you recognize the problem. Uh, it's a, the use of vasopressors for refractory hypotension despite fluid resuscitation, and the goal is to maintain a mean arterial pressure about 65 or more millimeters of mercury. If the initial lactate is greater than four, or if the patient is still hypotensive despite volume resuscitation, the uh, bundle recommends placing uh, central venous access to allow for appropriate and accurate measurement of a CVP, um, as well as measuring the mixed venous oxygen saturation in the venous circulation, or SCVO2. It is also felt important to remeasure the lactate, hopefully within that six-hour period uh, after initial therapy, usually within three to four hours of starting therapy, or at least a gap of between three and four hours between the first and second lactate. Also, the goal is to achieve a CVP greater than eight millimeters of mercury and an SCVO2 greater than 70%, which would be good indicators of appropriate uh, resuscitation. Other guideline changes included blood cultures within 45 minutes, uh, appropriately before antibiotics, obtaining maybe a 1,3 beta D glycan if you're suspecting a fungal infection from an, from an abdominal process, an abdominal infection or perforated bowel, appropriate antibiotics within the first hour for septic shock, the 30 cc per kilogram crystalloid bolus in the first few hours, the use of vasopressors or uh, Medications for maintaining blood pressure after volume resuscitation has changed a bit. The recommendation is still norepinephrine first, followed by epinephrine, and then vasopressin. Uh, dopamine is no longer recommended except for in patients maybe at risk for bradyarrhythmias uh, because of the high risk of arrhythmias is dopamine. The use of steroids is still somewhat controversial. The uh, indication for steroids is not clearly uh, sorted out by the cortical study but it's felt important to think about using steroids at a 200 milligram infusion over 24 hours if the patients are still hypotensive following volume and on uh, vasopressors. The initial river study was suggested aiming for a hemoglobin of 10, met with some criticism, and with our uh, trend now to not use so much blood and minimize blood use, the recommendation from the uh, surviving sepsis campaign was to at least maintain a hemoglobin of seven for appropriate oxygen delivery. So we have these current measures, commonly used measures, to help us with the diagnosis. Um, but could we do better? Is there more available? Well, there's no true ideal biomarker in this setting. 
the gold standard being a blood culture, which as we know is not positive. A lot of the time it's not available for at least 20, 12 to 24 hours and oftentimes longer than that. So what is the ideal biomarker? This is something that objectively is measured and reproducible. It's an indicator of a normal physiologic process, of a pathogenic process. It should have a pharmacological response to therapeutic intervention. It should reflect underlying biological processes, predicts clinical events. It should be quickly obtainable and reproducible. And above all, it should be affordable. So what do we have right now? Well, we have a gram stain. This is usually not available immediately in the emergency room. It takes time to get the appropriate medium to stain. It takes time for that to come back. Blood cultures, as we already said, are only positive, uh, a negative 50 to 70 percent of the time, um, even in patients who are proven to be in septic shock. Um, white cell count is very variable. Uh, CRP, very nonspecific. The procalcitonin uh, has come along as being a somewhat better, maybe more robust marker of infection than anything else we have right now. And when used in conjunction with clinical information and other objective data, it may be of significant benefit to helping uh, complete the puzzle in the initial diagnosis of sepsis. So there are other highly predictive markers of infection and bacteremia. These are currently available in the literature, but really not commercially available uh, for everyday use. These include the interleukin 6, 8, and 10, secretory phospholipase A, chromogranin A, estrem, and adrenomodulin. All show promise, but none are totally specific, and none has been uh, really available in a commercial setting, uh, certainly not cost effective. So commonly used biomarkers that we have available now that we're familiar with would include troponin, where an absolute cutoff level of 0.07 would suggest there might be some evidence of myocardial uh, dysfunction or injury. In that setting, patients often complain of chest pain, have an abnormal EKG or echocardiogram, which would help confirm the syndrome of cardiac involvement. Patients don't come into the hospital complaining of sepsis. It's somewhat more difficult to diagnose it. Uh, in the setting of heart failure, for example, uh, a BNP of greater than 100 would be indicative of a process going on, again, corroborated by you know, physical exam, history, and echocardiogram. Procalcitonin comes in with a normal level of less than 0.05, and it may be mildly elevated at 0.05 to 0.25, and there might be some low-level local inflammation going on. But once it gets above 0.25 to 0.5, if the clinical picture is suggestive of an infection, this might be appropriate to focus on, and it might require antibiotics in the setting of a respiratory tract infection. When you get to 0.5 or 2 or greater, then you're more at risk of a more significant infection, and when you're greater than 2, more likely to have the syndrome of sepsis as a potential in the right clinical setting. And you may, if you're lucky, get a positive blood culture. So in 1993, there was a strong correlation found between serum procalcitonin levels and bacterial infection. It's a sepsis-induced plasma protein. It's induced by severe bacterial infection. And the procalcitonin, calcitonin, catacalcium fragments are measured initially, were measured initially by antibody binding using the Lumi test, used by Brahms. What we're looking at is the 116 amino acid, peptide, polypeptide, procalcitonin, which is part of the uh, pre-procalcitonin complex. This is the normal uh, time course in kinetics following an endotoxin stimulus. You can see that within the first six hours of infection, as it starts to accelerate, there's a slight increase in procalcitonin uh, from zero to 50, and it can go up dramatically over the next six to 12 hours. And then if you take away the insult, or if you have appropriate therapy, you'll see a predictable reduction over the next several hours in procalcitonin levels if measured seriously, serially in uh, short time intervals. So how does it work? Well, in the normal setting, it's believed that procalcitonin, where well, it's known that procalcitonin is produced in the thyroid C, C cells, and the levels in the serum are very low. The procalcitonin is produced in the Golgi apparatus in the thyroid C cells and are cleaved intracellularly and only calcitonin is put out into the serum at very low levels. In the setting of a bacterial infection, which is mediated by interleukins and TNF-alpha, what happens is that there is a strong development and outpouring of procalcitonin from multiple cells and tissues across the body, 
And in those cells, there is no cleavage of the procalcitonin to calcitonin. So there's a huge outpouring of procalcitonin, which is uncleaved and does not have metabolic activity as far as calcium homeostasis is concerned. Hence, to see high levels of procalcitonin in the inflammatory situation in the setting of a bacterial infection. This is not cleared and cleaved in cellulite, so the levels are very high. In the setting of a viral infection, however, which is mediated by gamma interferon, this process is actually blocked, and you don't get an increase in procalcitonin levels uh, or calcitonin or procalcitonin levels in the serum to the same extent, which is important to note clinically, uh, as we'll see later on in one or two of the case examples. So these other biomarkers of acute infection inflammation, as we see, the time causes a variable IL-6, IL-10, TNF-alpha very quickly out of the gate and go up very high, and as you take away the endotoxin stimulus, the PCT levels come down, the, pro the CRP levels are somewhat slower to rise and somewhat slower to come down. With the tw approximately 20-hour half-life of procalcitonin, we see a predictable 50% per day reduction in level as the patients uh, improve with appropriate therapy. This is an earlier study from Professor Beat Mueller's uh, team from Basel, Switzerland, and what they showed was with multiple early levels of procalcitonin versus CRP, IL-6, and lactate, um, which is the line with the, with the triangles, um, the sensitivity and specificity of procalcitonin or calcitonin precursors was significantly higher than we see with lactate. 89% sensitivity, 94% specificity, and negative predictive value if the levels are not elevated the, the uh, predictability for it not being a bacterial infection was very high compared to lactate, which had a very low sensitivity specificity and very poor negative predictive value. And the importance to remember with this particular study was this looked at multiple results of the levels in the first few days, but predominantly the first 24 hours or so, which is key uh, in this setting, rather than just relying on a single marker in the first uh, arrival in the emergency room. This is a study looking at adding procalcitonin to the clinical data that we have from the SERS criteria. And when you added any one of these markers, CRP, pH, monocyte count, interleukins, 8 and 6, and procalcitonin, the only single entity that improved the sensitivity and specificity of the SERS criteria to a significant level uh, was adding procalcitonin with level 0 0.001, um, where the ROC, um, with the uh, procalcitonin was increased to uh, 0.94, whereas without the PCT it was 0 0.77. So it really increased the um, uh, accuracy of the search criteria in that setting. So PCT is uh, cleaved intracellularly and during severe infection and sepsis can rise to as high as 200. And this increase in procalcitonin is not accompanied by an increase in plasma calcitonin levels and has predictable half-life about 25 to 30 hours, which is a predictable drop-in levels as the patient gets better. The other important thing to note is procalcitonin by itself has a significant inflammatory uh, activity, uh, so it's good to see its levels come down. There are limitations, as there are with any test that we have. Um, there are some false negatives in very early infection. That's why I think it's very important to get a second and third, possibly a third level in the first 24 hours based on the severity of infection, uh, very early infection, localized infection, such as in a closed abscess, you may not see an elevation, and sometimes with entities such as subacute bacterial endocarditis, and maybe even uh, osteomyelitis, where you may not see a big systemic inflammatory response, and you may see very low levels um, of procalcitonin in the blood. There are some false positives where you see an increased elevation of procalcitonin, but this often tends to stay flat and does not have the same kinetics that you see with an acute bacterial infection. As you can see, things like burns, pancreatitis, trauma, um, cardiogenic shock can all cause an elevation, but they tend not to drop down as quickly as you would see with uh, treated infection. Um, but you do need to think about other entities when the clinical indication would suggest. This is a classic procalcitonin curve that we have from one, a patient that had community-acquired pneumonia, low initially on arrival, but rapidly goes up and then starts to come down with appropriate therapy. It's really gratifying to see the response to uh, treatment, and you know you're on the right track. Uh, 
This is uh, a recent meta-analysis from February of this year published in Critical Care and Medicine. And, um, sorry, in The Lancet. There are two previous critical care meta-analysis. The first was in 2006 in critical care medicine, but that was primarily focused on surgical patients. And it did show there's a significant improvement in uh, the ROC when looking at procalcitonin versus CRP, but this is restricted surgical patients. A second meta-analysis in 2007 in The Lancet um, included only 18 studies and showed not a great improvement in uh, ROC when you compared CRP, white count, and procalcitonin. There were some limitations to that study, however. The first of the studies that had sites of infection, such as abdominal sepsis, pancreatitis, meningitis, were left out. Also, patients with overt septic shock were left out, reducing the sensitivity and specificity of the study. And thirdly, this also included studies that were not, or did not have systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And so the differentiation between infected and non-infected patients with SIRS was was not so great, and thus reducing the sensitivity again and the diagnostic accuracy. This most recent um, meter analysis, however, uh, looked at some 3,400 studies, um, and out of these various articles, about 30 studies were felt to be appropriate for the meter analysis. This included some 3,244 patients, and this included studies up until 2012. If, and what the goal was to separate patients with um, sepsis from patients with non-infectious systemic inflammatory response syndrome. It's very specific looking at that to help differentiate inflammation, infectious versus non-infectious. And what it found was that the ROC, received operating curve, characteristic was of 0.85 um, to these patients with uh, sepsis. Um, which is significantly better than the patients who did not have sepsis but had systemic inflammatory response syndrome. It was important to note that the cutoff point that you used was, was different in the various studies. The mean cutoff point was over 1.1. However, when you look at all this data, if you had a PCT of less than, point zero, less than 0.5, it was unlikely that you had sepsis. And if you had a PCT of more than 2, it was more likely that you had sepsis. So a PCT cutoff of greater than 1.5 to 2 is probably appropriate in these patients where you're suspecting sepsis given the right clinical picture. So that was a much more robust analysis of the current data as we know it. And here you see the receiver operating curve. The other important thing to remember is this was most of these studies are designed around the first point in time use of procalcitonin. And we believe that this gets even more robust when you use two or three in the first 24 hours where the sensitivity and specificity is, specificity is markedly improved. This is a uh, poster that we presented, our group presented in conjunction with Dr. Schutz from Basel at SCCM in 2012 at the meeting, National Congress. And what this was designed to show was that despite the severity of illness at presentation, if your Apache 4 score was less than 72, between 72 and 86, then greater than 86, if your procalcitonin level dropped by more than 90%, your mortality rate was significantly reduced, compared to if you did not reduce your procalcitonin by more than uh, 51 to 90%, and if you went down by less than 90%, your mortality rate was very high, and there was an almost six-fold increase in mortality rate if you did not drop your procalcitonin in the first few days of therapy. So it's a very good indicator of mortality um, and survival uh, if you did not drop your uh, procalcitonin with appropriate therapy, which makes you want to look for other things um, if the PCT isn't coming down. So from this point, we go on to um, the uh, ED sepsis um, planning that we have and the way we pick up patients in our sepsis uh, protocol. This is uh, Dr. Hare again. Treating sepsis is a team approach. I'll repeat that. Treating sepsis is a team approach. You've got to involve everyone. Dr. Amin has given us great data, but how at your facility can you put this in place? How can you get a sepsis alert? How can you get a sepsis screening? It is a, a multidisciplinary approach, and that would include registration. 
ICU nurse, intensivist, emergency department nurse, an emergency department physician, respiratory therapist, and a unit clerk. And what we did was we got them together for a planning session, a series of collaborative meetings, but most importantly, involve your hospital administrators. Let them understand the, what, what they need to accomplish with sepsis treatment, and that will decrease the length of stay for these patients. It will decrease the cost of care for these patients. We created a screening tool with our EMR, and we screen roughly about 30 to 40 patients per day. That screening tool involves the lactate level, the blood, uh, the blood pressure, it checks for tachycardia, uh, CBC, a BMP, but also certainly a procalcitonin is in there. And we launched the plan. We set a start date. We had posters posted throughout the facility. We had balloons, we had pizza and everything, so everyone knew, just like as in an MI, that this is something that is very important that we have to take seriously. Once we do identify a patient as having sepsis, the physician then would initiate a sepsis alert. That alert is called to the operator. The operator sends out a stat page that goes to our admitting team, our transfer center, teletracking bed control. The administrator on duty also is aware of the patient, so they can come down and assist in the emergency department or go up to the ICU, see if there is needs to, or need to be met up there. The ICU charge nurse is also notified. Our lab, we have labs that are done within our emergency department, are then super stats, such as our lactate level, our procalcitonin, all of those labs, so many blood cultures are drawn. And respiratory therapy is paged as well in case we would need them. The team member then stat pages the primary care physician. They have 15 minutes to return that call. We would like to have it, their input as to which intensivist they'd like to use. Obviously, there are long-standing relationships. If they don't return that call, however, within that 15-minute time span, we do have a call matrix where we actually have a sepsis call, and there's an intensivist that's on call. Now, certainly if the patient has an established intensivist, then we would use that intensivist. When we speak with our intensive care physicians, we then determine the need for a central venous catheter, the timing of that insertion, and who's going to insert the line. When the central venous catheter is placed, we then get an SCVO2 and a CVP. Respiratory therapy is, is advised, we need their assistance, and the administrator on duty then notifies the ED of the bed availability up in the ICU. Our ED also has a sepsis alert power plan that assures compliance with the SSC bundle. It assures the central line is placed. It assures that we have 30 mLs per kg bolus of fluid. It assures measurement of the CVP and the SCVO2, and also that the appropriate antibiotics are given. Again, we screen 30 to 40 patients per day. We come up with about one to two per day that we're treating. Screening, though, and I'll say it again, screening is the key to finding these patients that are septic. Patients come in and complain of chest pain. That's easy, you get an EKG. Patients don't come in complaining of sepsis. Thank you. Uh, again, it's very important to emphasize as a team effort, whether it's done in the emergency room or on the floor, these patients are found in the emergency room, on the floor, and in the intensive care unit. And it's very important to start the process early with early recognition. We believe that uh, when you're reaching for blood cultures and setting a significant infection, we do bring in procalcitonin at that point. We will repeat one at six or 12 hours, and again at 24 hours, to try and get a complete picture as to what's going on and to see the peak of the procalcitonin level so we have a, a goal as to where we're going with treatment when the levels start dropping over the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. At this point, I think we'll move on to some case reports um, and case studies, which I think will be helpful in understanding how we've been using procalcitonin. This is a patient with uh, presenting with shortness of breath, bilateral infiltrates. The initial X-ray report was suggestive of a pneumonia. 
and recommended follow-up for clearance. Um, there was some forces right hilum, which may be vascular, but also suspicious for nodal enlargement. So the usual, somewhat ambiguous chest X-ray report that we see. Uh, on the following day, the chest X-ray was read as showing ongoing perihilate alveolar edema with increasing prevalent interstitial edema consistent with congestive heart failure. So totally different reading the following day by a different radiologist. Um, the patient clearly had previous cardiac surgery, so it could be heart failure, it could be pneumonia. So in the clinical setting, what did we find? Well, uh, clinically the patient could have had either, but when we looked at our lab work, the um, white count was somewhat elevated, about 16,000, went up and came down. The troponin level was somewhat elevated, went up and came down over time. The PCT in this setting was never really elevated. So this was not pneumonia. This was consistent with heart failure in the setting of a myocardial infarction. And even though antibiotics started at the onset because of the reading and the ambiguous white count, they were able to be stopped within 24 hours in this particular case because the PCT was never elevated and the findings consistent with heart failure and, and uh, MI. The second case is uh, a case of a 34-year-old male who presented with spina bifida. He's a paraplegic, low-grade fevers. He has left leg swelling um, for several weeks, sacred the cubit eye ulcers. He was brought in because of altered mental status by emergency medical services. He had a history of a neurogenic bladder, had been self-catheterizing four times a day, had a VP shunt. He was hypotensive, tachycardic, had a several illness and plenty of data highly consistent with infection and sepsis. Um, he had an elevated white count, uh, low hemoglobin, iron deficiency anemia, lactic acidosis, and very elevated PCT. His blood cultures were positive subsequently with multiple organisms. And this is a classic case of presentation of sepsis. We see an initial elevated level, a, a higher level, and then an improvement following appropriate antibiotic institution. As in any process, and in any infection, how severe it is. Infections don't get better within minutes. They take hours or days to get better. So despite starting antibiotics in one stream, it takes a day or so for them to kick in, but you, you see a, a gratifying reduction in the procalcitonin in green coming down uh, nicely with appropriate therapy. The third case is a 68-year-old male with one-day history of lethargy, headache, disorientation, and some increasing blood pressure in the ED. You can see the past medical history as well as the social history. Vital signs aren't overly impressive. Slight to near elevated temperature at 99.4. Verbally confused. Normal cardiopulmonary exam, benign neuro exam, except for being confused. Does have a headache and some neck stiffness, as any good emergency department physician would do. Checked out labs, white blood cell count at 12.1. Hemoglobin, that's okay, normal. PCT over time, 0 0.1, 0 0.10, 0 0.12, CAT scan of the brain, unremarkable. That calls for an LP. You can see the results of the test there. Uh, some white uh, blood cell count in the uh, LP fluid at 45, red blood cells at 70, stakes at 13, lymphs at 35, monos 52, glucose 96, and protein at 70 B, 73, giving changes that are consistent with viral meningitis. The graph there shows your white blood cell count, lactic acid, and procalcitonin. Procalcitonin all below 0 0.25, which speaks to a very strong negative predictive value. Our next case is a 76-year-old male from home, flu-like symptoms for several days, increasing dyspnea, cough, less activity, back pain, cramps for a few days, history of a prosthetic knee, coronary artery disease, aortic stenosis, some exposure to asbestos, also a smoker in the past, stopped 25 years ago. Physical exam has a fever of 102.5, blood pressure 123 over 65, heart rate and respiratory rates as seen. Cardiac exam has a pan-systolic 2 over 6 left sternal edge murmur, lungs, He's got basal arouse. The abdominal exam is benign. Extremities with no edema. On chest x-ray, it's read as possible infiltrate, atelectasis, and or vascular congestion. Bit of a confusing picture. White cell counts only eight. 
hemoglobin's 14.6, BUN creatinine sodium chloride, BUN creatinine ratio all normal. ABG, a little bit abnormal, 7.32, 28 and 72, potassium 4.4 by that. Bicarb though was 13 with an anion gap of 15. Lactic acid slightly elevated. PCT drawn at zero, 12 hours, and then at 24 hours shows a rise of 1.25, 1.75, and 58.5. Troponin, 0.21, and BNP, 800. Early sepsis is the diagnosis secondary to community-acquired pneumonia. Treatments with row 7 and Zithromax. One day later, the blood culture showed gram-positive rods, I'm sorry, gram-negative rods, and you can see the two x-rays on the 12th and then on the 16th. slide shows the white blood cell count and the procalcitonin, and again, significant improvement in PCT with appropriate therapy. Case number five is an 89-year-old male with dyspnea cough, temperature of 99.8, some crackles, white cell count of 15.8, history of cardiomyopathy, could be pneumonia, could be CHF. Next slide. Next slide then shows the white blood cell count and the procalcitonin, obviously assisting you with your diagnosis. So the next case is an interesting case of a 74-year-old female presented just after Christmas in 2008. We've been using procalcitonin at that time for about six months, and the patient presented with fever, cough, and shortness of breath. X-ray looked like pneumonia. Uh, she was started empirically on antibiotics. She seemed to improve and was sent home. She was readmitted on, in January, about a week and a half, maybe two weeks later, with worsening dyspnea, cough, low-grade fever, failure to thrive, and at this point, with increasing infiltrates, was felt to have a healthcare-associated pneumonia and really failure the first round of therapy and treatment. At that time, when we saw her, we noticed that procalcitonin was still very low. It had never risen on the previous admission, and then it was kind of confusing as to why she had these bilateral infiltrates that have all the signs and symptoms of pneumonia, but really not have an elevation of procalcitonin. Chest CAT scan at that time showed there were bilateral uh, infiltrates and bilateral effusions, and clearly she had something abnormal going on, but it wasn't typical of a bacterial infection. She underwent bronchoscopy and biopsy, transbronchial biopsy, and this confirmed the diagnosis of bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia. And in this setting, um, clearly uh, we were able to stop antibiotics and start her on steroids, and she did significantly better and was able to be seen as a follow-up in the outpatient clinic. So this is an example where the negative predictive value was very strong, enabling us to move forward with the diagnostic procedure very quickly instead of waiting seven to 10 days for antibiotics to finish. In fact, prior to the bronchoscopy, the family were considering making her a comfort measures only as she was failing failing uh, to respond to antibiotics, uh, but she did uh, go home. The last case we'd like to present is uh, of a patient who underwent surgery for a low AP resection for a colonic tumor, discharged home doing well, and represented the emergency room a few days after discharge with increasing abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, low-grade temperature. His initial white cell count was only 10, uh, PCT habit was 9.19, and he underwent urgent CAT scan of the abdomen pelvis that showed extensive peritonitis, air fluid levels throughout the small intestine, possible central pelvic and pericolic gutter fluid and abscess formation, suggestive of an anastomotic leak. The patient had a profile consistent with sepsis, there was sudden early goal directed therapy, appropriate antibiotics and laparotomy, reoperated on and found to have an anastomotic leak. Uh, the procalcitonin continued to rise for a day or so and then started to come down with appropriate therapy. So again, this is a very good early mark in the emergency room when the patient clearly had an abnormal physical exam, was looking sick but not critically ill, but clearly with a critical PCT at that time, uh, it really accelerated the process in, in the CAT scan and then surgery um, to follow to help uh, clear up this patient's problem. So this is a good selection of cases that we have seen, and there are plenty more um, just to uh, review our use of procalcitonin.
I'd like to summarize um, by reviewing procalcitonin in this setting. Basically, it's a precursor peptide of the hormone calcitonin. It does have a pro-inflammatory effect. The measurement is significant for clinically relevant bacterial infection. It has a 20 to 24-hour half-life. We believe it's useful in the early diagnosis of severe bacterial infection and sepsis. It has data suggests it's helpful in risk assessment. It has a very robust negative predictive value. And um, I think it's been very helpful for us in helping improve our sepsis screening tool and our initiation of the sepsis uh, management that we have ongoing in the intensive care unit. I'd like to stop our presentation at this time. Okay, great. Well, we are just about out of time, so I would like to thank Dr. Hare and Dr. Min for today's presentation. I'd also like to once again thank our sponsor, Bio Mirier. So at this time, I'll end the program. Thank you.